So, welcome back to another episode of the Soft to Wealth with Tactics podcast. It is 7.41 a.m. at the time. Um, and I actually kind of look pretty tired. I am not that tired. I kind of feel a bit fucked, to be honest. Because I just don't sleep enough, apparently. Yeah. And the thing is, I'm on vacation quite. Like, I don't have to work. And it is dumb as shit. You know, of course, I do, well, I thought about enjoying my last two days of um, not having to work and not having to do quite anything. And I I really want to enjoy them, you know. So I thought, well, let's also go to bed relatively early yesterday so that I can enjoy the whole day today and also tomorrow, therefore, and, and have a great time. But yeah, sleep is good and important. And if you don't get enough sleep, then you're gonna feel not that good. And this is what I'm experiencing. And this is what I've been experiencing the past few days as well, which is dumb as fuck. Anyway, Walter Annabergs or Annabergs stance of philanthropy or stance, whatever. He thought rich people should give it all away before they died, lest their appointed stewards dishonor their obligations. Buffett had the energy and enthusiasm of a relentless teenager. He seemed to remember every fact and figure he had ever read. He finagled, finished, filled whatever people into volunteering for tough jobs, then assumed they could accomplish miracles. And while remarkably tolerant of others' quirks and flaws, he was less so of quirks and flaws that cost him money. So eager for results was he, so confident of other skills, so unaware of how far short of his own they fell, that he chronically underestimated people's workloads. And did everything himself? Question mark? Probably. His trick of management being to find obsessed perfectionists like himself who worked in incess what incessantly? The question now is, you know, how does education play into that? Meaning, I mean uh, Berkshire Hathaway, I think it is pronounced, I'm not quite sure, which is his company, uh, still is his company. You know, I do want to underline that. I think it is, since it is a very big company and a very known company and a famous one. And I mean, the boss, the CEO, being uh, Warren Buffett, is is one of the richest people in the world. I mean, there have to be certain, um, it, it must be quite complicated to work for them. The question is, that I had to think about, how does education play into that? And what I mean by saying that is... <clears throat> If you went to Harvard, I know that Warren Buffett himself didn't go to Harvard, didn't go to, to Stanford, didn't go to any other Ivy League, uh, Ivy League school. Um, and so I wonder, you know, does he think just because you went to Harvard that you do have this certain obsession or this certain obsession with perfer- uh, perfectionism? And or do you not have to have any degree in anything related to the company, but this mindset and this type of personality so that it can work for him or the company, therefore. It would actually be quite interesting. I mean, maybe I have to Google it then, probably not gonna do it anyway. In making ethical decisions. If you're not sure if something is right or wrong, consider whether you'd want it reported in in the morning paper. Which by the way, I think is very important. I mean, um, is it ethicity? Ethnity, eth- eth- well, you know what I mean. Uh, making ethical decisions, the right ethical decisions. I think it is very important for a company and its reputation also for oneself. I mean, I do know that there are certain people that really don't give a fuck about anything that has anything to do with ethical things. I mean, they're just going to do whatever is going to bring them the most money. There is enough people of that kind, unfortunately. But... um. Yeah, I, I couldn't do that. I mean, I still have certain problems with investing in the stocks because I don't know what the company is going to do with my money. And I, or one really has to make sure that, um, well, or, or I think about investing into companies that really do good with their money, you know, not certain companies that are, you know, stealing water and so on and so forth. I mean, there is going to be certain companies that I just don't want to, um, that 
that I don't want to give my money to. But the problem is when you think about ETFs, you know, and or force quite and the amount of companies that you're just giving your money to, it is it is quite a lot. And so one really would have to go through every single company and, and kind of analyze it. And um, I mean, it is a lot of work and whatnot. And I think most often you're going to come to the conclusion, okay, I'm just not going to invest into that ETF. But the problem is ETFs are a pretty good solution for long-term wealth building and or at least sustaining. And so it is kind of a, a fucked up decision, you know. Here, Warren Buffett was a likable boss who never lost his temper, never changed his money uh, capriciously, never said a rude word to anyone, never betrayed or criticized his employees, didn't second-guess people on their work and let them do their jobs without interference. He also operated on the assumption that if someone was smart, they could do anything. I like that style. I, I really do. And I do think that maybe it is, well, it probably is due to um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, um, of which Warren Buffett is a pretty big advocate of and um, likes it quite a lot. But, and also he said that a Dale Carnegie public speaking course was one of the most important educational uh, cor- well courses that he ever took, you know, and one of the most important things that he ever quote unquote, studied and learned how to communicate and how to, um, well, I would actually say how to say what is going on in your head. And I think this is always going to be important and it is always going to be of worth, no matter fucking what. Anyway, um, being a likable boss is going to make everything better for everyone, for your employees and for yourself. Because of course, if your employees like you, then I think the probability is also a bit higher that they're they going to do a better job and that they're going to work harder and they're maybe, you know, going to come up with new ideas and new things on how to do things and, and whatnot. I think, I mean, it is a cycle, it is a wheel and everything is kind of, kind of pushing everything else. Like, yeah, if you're a good boss, you're probably also going to have good employees. Not everyone, of course, you know, there's still going to be some people that are, a, you're going to take advantage of that. B, not going to work anyway, just because it's not their personality. It's not just the type of person they are and so on and so forth. I mean, there's just way too many variables and way too many shades of gray in this whole black and white picture of life that there uh, wouldn't be somebody that did that. Anyway, I didn't get in fights just to get in fights. Buffett also thought, which by the way is a quote, but Buffett also thought in black and white terms about honesty. He had no tolerance for liars and cheaters, which I can understand, unless you're not doing it yourself. Lose money for the firm and I will, and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I will be ruthless, which I can understand. I was at my best at giving financial advice when I was 21 years old and people weren't listening to me. I could have gotten up there and said the most brilliant thing and not very much attention would have been paid to me. And now I can say the dumbest things in the world and a fair number of people will think there's some great hidden meaning to it or something. Yeah, I mean, there's always, I mean, ups and downsides of whatever we're talking about. It is unclear how many people at the table understood focus as Buffett lived that word. This kind of innate focus couldn't be emulated. It meant the intensity that is the price of excellence. It meant the discipline and passion of perfectionism that made Thomas Edison the quintessential American inventor, Walt Disney the the king of family entertainment, and James Brown the godfather of soul. It meant single-minded obsession with an idea. Ideal. Buffett's intuitional imperative, the tendency for companies to engage in activity for its own sake and to copy their peers instead of trying to stay ahead of them. Munger often attributed much of Buffett's success to the fact that he was a learning machine. Their common intellect, interests and way of thinking gave them considerable common ground. They shared the same intensity. Andrew Carnegie's stance of philosophy. Is it too much for the rest well i'm gonna end the episode there i'm gonna go through that the next time and yeah i wish you best see you soon bye bye